for joining us at South Point during the most wonderful time of the year. The Christmas season is about the gift that God gave to us in the form of His Son. Our prayer is that this message would lead others into a growing relationship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We are in the middle of a 90-day giving challenge because He first gave. During the hustle and bustle of the Christmas season, we want to make sure our hearts and minds are focused on the real meaning of Christmas, Jesus. He gave so that we might in turn give to others. Today, we encourage you to engage in the teaching as we explore the gifts that were given to Jesus after his birth. Please go to our Facebook page or our website and let us know how this message has encouraged you. Now, let's listen as Pastor David brings this week's message. Hey, good morning. Everybody doing good? All right. Oh, man, great response now. Um, hey, uh, a couple of things I want to mention. If you are in um, the Brower or Weiniger, uh, I know, Bill, you, you teach in those uh, small groups. If you're in one of those groups, would you just slide your hand up? Let me just kind of see you. Give me just a little bit of house lights for a second. All right, let me just kind of look around. All right, I see. Man, you're scattered throughout here. All right, good. Hey, can I just say to you all, thank you? Here's why. And I know lots of, lots of activity, lots of stuff's going on, but those two small groups, I caught wind of something you guys did with one of our local friends here. Um, I know you guys went over to the Samaritan Inn. We've done a lot of work down at the Samaritan Inn and during the Thanksgiving season, kind of over the last month and a, month and a half. You all went down to the uh, Samaritan Inn and uh, painted a couple of rooms and then helped provide some, some ways for them to store clothes for families. If you're not familiar with the Samaritan Inn, it's a ministry in the inner city of, uh, of Leesburg that helps families uh, in a time of critical, critical need that are without housing. And uh, a couple of our groups kind of partnered with them. And uh, Paul, thanks. Thanks for leading an effort to be able to do that. And uh, Jack, uh, thank you guys for what you guys did to help with that and Bill and all of those associated with that group. And I know you guys also, anybody, anybody ever been to North Dakota? Yeah. Well, let me just tell you, North Dakota in the summertime is cold, <laughs> let alone wintertime. I, I'm, I, listen, we moved here from Buffalo. We get cold. And sometimes some kids need hats and gloves and stuff. And I also heard about some hats and gloves you guys sent. Uh, there's an Indian reservation up there that does ministry uh, as a Christian organization to help families and kids. And I just wanted to say to you all, those are hero type stuff that happen in the midst of lots of activity. And, uh, and I just wanted to say thank you. And all of you, if you're in those groups, I don't want you to clap, but everybody else, would you just say thank you, maybe by applause. Thank you guys. Oh, yeah. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love hearing those kinds of stories. If you know of a great story, I'd love to hear about it. And by the way, don't be hesitant to share it with me and go, oh, I don't want him to share it publicly. I don't have to share it publicly. Uh, I just love hearing your stories of God's grace. As God uh, shows grace in your life, you turn around and show grace. As I, did you look at all the presents back there in the back? Everybody gets what next week, there's going to be a whole lot of families come in here. We have four ministry partners that we're doing gifts for. But most of those, if not all of those, all of those wrapped up presents probably are for kids that are not going to have a mom or dad this Christmas. Uh, parents have, uh, are not there to be at home with their children for a number of reasons, mostly of which have been uh, incarcerated. And uh, so those wrapped presents are back there for them to have a present. By the way, it's not a present from South Point or you. It's a present from their parent. We just partnered with them. So what a way for us to show God's grace and we're going to share the gospel with them. And so that's a really cool piece to what's happening during the Christmas season. And, uh, and I got one more housekeeping thing. Can I do some housekeeping stuff and then we can go straight into uh, Matthew chapter 2. Hey, Hal, can you come join me, man? I, I know uh, I asked you last week if we could do this. I'm going to have him come join us. Hal, you graduated from Tavares High School last June and uh, graduated with a... Uh, a really good degree from Tavares High School. <laughs> and uh, my kids go to Tavares, my girls graduate from Tavares, and my son, this is my son's fishing partner, and uh, they fish a lot together, and he is one sad camper right now, but at the same time, we're gonna rejoice because today, Hal will be driving to Jacksonville, Florida, where he will join the proud men and women that serve our United States Navy. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. There you go. 
No, don't leave, don't leave. All right, hang on. Uh, I, here's what I'd like to do. Can we just, we need to pray over him. Um, you're going active service? Yes. So, uh, yeah, big deal, big deal. How many of you have served in our Navy? All right. Mom and dad uh, are a very active family involved in our church. Hal typically is kind of controlling lights for us in the services a lot of times. And uh, so we'll miss him on our media team. Um, but, uh, but we are, rather than think of loss, we're going to think of partnership. So now a whole bunch of men and women are going to see an incarnational demonstration of who Jesus Christ is in the Navy. And may, uh, may he serve Jesus well as he serves our country well. Is that fair enough? So we're just, we're asking for you to be commissioned like you're a missionary. And, uh, and, and really, and don't be a weirdo out there, but uh, <laughs> you, you, don't want anything, you don't want anything goofy to happen, but, uh, but just live out Jesus, man. Be, be real, be authentic, um, and uh, live out Jesus. So here's what I'd like. And, and I was thinking, uh, knowing this mo moment was coming, I thought it was gonna be last Sunday. So I was prepared last Sunday a little bit differently emotionally, but uh, I'm prepared today as well. I'd like for us, um, if we could, to just take a moment, pray over him, and, um, and would you join me in praying over him? Is that okay? And, and maybe, and I, this may sound a little odd to you, but maybe, maybe it'll help us to kind of engage a little bit better. Could you just kind of reach out your hand towards Hal? I, not everybody can put their hand on him, and I'll just kind of represent us, and we're just going to lay hands on him. Is that okay? So if you'll just reach out your hand. Why don't we stand? It'll make it a little easier for you. Stand, and, uh, and we'll just pray. Praying for mom and dad as well, and sister. And uh, all right, let's pray. Jesus, I lift up my friend, my buddy to you. And uh, we recognize that in life change, as our kids get older and they mature, sometimes even if they don't mature, they get older. Um, we know that uh, life is going to bring about changes. And so for the Davis family, significant change is happening, but specifically for Hal. As he uh, goes to serve our incredible military, we thank you for him, for his testimony, for his love, for you, for the church, and for our country. I pray that you'd bless him. May, uh, may he serve well. May you protect him. And uh, we ask that we would get to hear great stories of your grace in his life. May we not forget that he is gone, but may we continue to remember his, his, uh, his life in the protection prayers that we offer on a daily basis, and may we continue to pray for him. So may he know that his church loves him. We look forward to seeing him when he comes back. I pray for the Davises as they travel to Jacksonville today and uh, the different meetings that they've got. May they uh, have a sweet time as a family. I pray for Mama and Daddy. Um, give them courage and strength. And I pray for Hannah and uh, just love this family. I thank you for them. Lord, while we're praying, there are some other folks as I walked into the room today that are on my heart. God, could I offer up just prayer for them? God, I pray for Barbara Cahalan that has just had a lot of physical challenges lately. Normally sitting here in her wheelchair, can't be with us today. So I pray for her today, for strength. Lord, for Lori and Michael, Two of our folks in the room right now that I know, and probably others, but I know specifically, are walking through cancer. And it's tough. I pray for their families. God, give them strength. May they know how loved they are. May they sense your incredible love and spirit wrapping around them. Lord, I pray for my friend Vicki. Lost her husband this week. That's sitting in this room. My goodness, God, would you pour out grace, please? Lord, uh, for Charlotte and Glenn, gone through so many physical challenges, and Bill Cohey would love to be here. Pray for him at Lake Harris today. For Mr. Pierre, as I saw Miss Roberta sitting in the room, praying for her husband, can I pray for strength for him? for encouragement. Lord, uh, 
Those are just a few of the needs in the body of Christ here called South Point. So we lift these up to you and in agreement together, this body of Christ, this expression, affirms together that we recognize you can heal. We recognize that you are the great physician. You are also the great protector. And so we ask in the precious and holy name of Jesus that these things will be done for your glory and all of God's people in unison said together. Amen. Amen. Love you, buddy. Thank you. See you, man. All right. Uh, all right, let me gather myself. Um, last year at Christmas, uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the gifts I got last year at Christmas. I wanted to show it to you uh, because uh, this is the first time I'd ever gotten a gift quite like this one. I... Uh, I like this kind of stuff. I'm, you know, whatever you think of me, whatever. Um, but but it, but I had never, I had never had these little strips in here. They're little incense strips. I'd never had those before. I kind of thought of those. I didn't grow up in that kind of a family. I kind of thought of that as '60-ish, from the '60s. Kind of yeah, felt a little weird. But I got sporty one night, and I was doing some, uh, some schoolwork and uh, working on my graduate work, and uh, it was a year ago. And so I, I did it typically in our daughter's room, and uh, so I had the door kind of pushed to, and, uh, and I had taken one of those out, and I had lit it, lit it up. And, uh, I, and maybe you're, you're like that, and this little jar came with it. Thank you to the person that gave me this. This was a really cool gift for me. And, uh, and what I did was I lit it up, and it's this little stick. And you light these things. I, I didn't even know how to do it. I actually Googled how to do this. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny, but I'm, I think that's how you do it. And it puts off this scent. Now, <clears throat> the scent that I wanted to burn for you today, you are going to s smell this. This is frankincense. Ooh. Now... I'm going to tell you that I about lost my voice in the first service as this thing burned the entire time. And I can tell it's already getting to me again. So I'm going to let it go for just a second. Um, and here's why. Um, Scents are, things like this, they trigger memories for us. If you've ever thought about the way when you smell something, it allows you to remember something. Are you smelling it yet? Yeah. All right, good. Those in the back aren't smelling it. Yeah, it's coming. All right, is it getting strong? Yeah, some of you want it to go over your heads. Uh, it, uh, they trigger things. And let me tell you what this triggered for me. I, it was one of these in this box, and I lit it up. And, uh, and I'm doing schoolwork, and you know what scent it triggered for me? It triggered this scent of one day my wife and I, we, we had done premarital counseling for months with a young couple. And this young couple wanted to not do a traditional church marriage, uh, church wedding, excuse me, they were doing a Christian marriage. They didn't want to do it in a church. They decided to get married on the beach. Now, we lived in Buffalo, so we thought, you know, when you live in Buffalo, to the beach was a cool deal. And, uh, and so they decided they're going to go to the beach for their wedding, and they needed just a few people to come. So mom and dad, grandparents, siblings. Not all the siblings, just a couple of the siblings got to go. <laughs> And that was how they paid, but they also took the minister and one guest. So I took my wife. So we had to do some preliminary work before we got there and a little bit of background work after they left. So we were there for a whole week in St. Lucia. Yeah, so if you're ever thinking about getting married or do, redoing your vows on the beach, call me. I am available <laughs> if we're going somewhere in the islands like St. Lucia. And I, I was burning this thing, and it reminded me of the time we were in St. Lucia. And I'm just, I'm doing schoolwork. I've got headphones on. I've got this candle burnt, this, this stick burning. And I'm just having the time. And all of a sudden, I, people charge into the room. What's the smell? What's going on? And everybody's eyes are like swelling up and <laughs> pouring out. And I had to immediately kind of do like this. Woo, let's put that thing out. Because it just got overwhelming. The scent was overwhelming. Now, can you imagine giving this gift to a toddler? <laughs> um, a, 
April, just so you know, I went looking for Evan. I was thinking about bringing Evan in with me to do this illustration, and then I chose not to. I actually was there. I was looking for him, and then I chose not to. Um, can you imagine a one-and-a-half-year-old, maybe a, a two-year-old child? This is their gift? Seems odd, doesn't it? I mean, when you think about gifts for a toddler, we think, let's get them a ball, a push lawnmower to be like dad, or a lightsaber. <laughs> we think about those kind of gifts, a, a, a ninja. But incense? Why give a toddler, a child, incense? It almost seems irresponsible. So, I got to thinking about the gifts that were given to Jesus. And incense, frankincense specifically, was one of those gifts. People are coughing in the room from my incense. I'm so sorry. I put it out quick. I'd let it burn the whole last service. Uh, can you imagine that being the gift that, uh, that your child, if you had a grandchild and you showed up at the birth of that child and you said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this baby some incense. Seems a little odd. Seems a little crazy. But that's what we're doing this Christmas season. We're trying to think Rather than just take our theology from a song or from a Hallmark card, let's take it from what does Scripture have to say, read it, make application, how does this apply to our lives? So that's really what we've been doing. And last week we talked a little bit about the gold, and I'll reference it again as we go this week. And today I want to talk a little bit about maybe one of these other gifts. Because in a word-for-word -word translation, which, by the way, today I'm going to read a thought-for-thought -thought translation, not that that makes a big deal to everybody in the room, but just so you know. That's why sometimes I'll say, well, there's a different word used here. A thought-for-thought -thought might use the word incense. A word-for-word -word translation may use the word frankincense. Um, and so um, we're, going to, we're going to process through this. Now, this Thursday marks the 112th anniversary of a really significant moment in the U.S. history, really worldwide history. Now, some of you will remember this event from 1903. It was, uh, <laughs> I said it in the first service, not one single laugh, <laughs> nothing. It was like, all right, everybody missed it. It's probably because majority of them were there at this event and <laughs> I'm sorry. I love you folks from the first service. You're incredible. You're not really 112. Um, but in, uh, in 1903, there was a couple of guys from Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And you'll remember what they did. They flew for the first time. And they were so excited. What they did was they sent a notice to Catherine, their sister. And they said to Catherine, these are the Wright brothers, and they said to Catherine, Catherine, you are not going to believe it. And, and here's kind of the quote from their, their comments to their brothers. They said, we just flew a plane 120 feet. And go on to say a few other things, and she's all excited. And we're going to be home for Christmas. And Catherine was so excited. You did it, guys. You did it. It's awesome. You flew a plane. It's going to change the course of humanity. It's awesome. And I cannot wait to see you in just a few days as you're coming home for Christmas. I'm so excited to see you. And so Catherine, as most sisters might would do or a sibling would do, goes down to the local newspaper and says, hey, you gotta write this, you gotta write this down, you gotta let everybody know, my brothers just flew 120 feet. I mean, it was un incredible what they're telling me about. It was unbelievable, they flew 120 feet. Man has flown. And, and, you, and when they get home, you can see them because they're coming home for Christmas. And the reporter was so excited. He said, I'm, I'm stoked about it as well. I cannot wait to see your two brothers. And he writes one piece. The Wright brothers are coming home for Christmas. <laughs> that was it. Never mentions they flew a plane. Completely missed the significant details of the story. And I'm afraid sometimes at Christmas, that's what happens with Christmas. We miss the significant story of Christmas. And we get caught up in singing a song like, We Three Kings of Orient Are. And then we realize, wait a minute, Scripture never even says it was three kings, let alone three people. 
let alone from the Orient. And we can create a Christmas theology that perhaps doesn't often line up with Scripture. And so all we said was this Christmas, let's, let's press pause and let's take a few Sundays during the month of December and let's just take a look at what does Scripture have to say about the most significant news to all of mankind. God came to earth in the form of a baby. He didn't come in the royal pomp and circumstance as a king. He came as a baby. I mean, it's pretty crazy to think about. And so all we wanted to do is kind of process because we can get so excited about Christmas and get so caught up. Hey, can I encourage you? If you are a person that is participating in 90 days of generosity and you are a giving person, whether you're participating or not, you are a person of generosity. I think we all recognize we can't do for everyone in the world what we'd like to do. We'd like to help everybody and give a present to everybody. But sometimes what the enemy will do is will he will distort the truth in our hearts and minds. And so what we'll do is we'll say, well, because I can't give to everybody, I just won't give to anybody. Can I just encourage you? A pastor in Atlanta named Andy Stanley said this phrase and it kind of captured my heart. It had shelf life. And he said, do for one what you'd like to do for all. So listen, this Christmas, this season, you may not be able to do for the whole block. You may not be able to help the whole everybody in the hospital. You may not be able to help everybody in the church, but do for one what you'd like to do for all. And may in that process, people see and hear and experience the greatest news, the gift of Jesus Christ. Now, today, um, if you are a blank person, you like to fill in the worship guide. We have worship guides for you today. You can kind of follow along on the back of that. There's three blanks on there, and I'll tell you those words up front, and then we're going to talk about them. It's the men who gave the gift, the meaning of the gift, and the one who got the gift. So men, meaning, and one are kind of where we're going. Matthew chapter 2. Uh, let's start back at verse number one. Now, I read this entire 11 verses. I actually read a little bit further last week, but all 11. I'm only going to read three of these verses this week. Please go back, reread Matthew chapter 2 again. Understand in context fully what the Lord has for you. Matthew chapter 2, verse number one. After Jesus was born, so sometime after he was born. Everybody got that? So after Jesus was born, not, he's not in the manger. It's after he's been born, so sometime after. Um, during the time of King Herod, we talked about King Herod last week. Man, I am all over up here. We talked about King Herod last week. Um, so after uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi, my translation says Magi, yours might say wise men, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, and the Magi asked this question. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, <clears throat> there are scholars that believe this was as much as maybe two to two and a half years after the birth of Christ. We don't have the specific details, and when there's not specifics, I just offer some caution to how we, when we do our inductive Bible study, then how we proclaim that, how we translate that, we just need to have some caution. So I'm walking with caution here. I don't know exactly when it was. My guess would be somewhere around 24 months after the birth of Christ, this probably happened. That would be my, my best guess. And, and there's reasons behind that. Whatever that time frame is, we know that Jesus has gone from being an infant in the arms of his mother to a toddler at this point. He's a child. And, um, and, and so what we know is that Scripture tells us that when they arrive, that he is this child no longer in a manger. 
If you've been around a toddler any time recently, maybe he's begun to walk and, and run around and play. I would guess at this age he would be. And so who are the men that show up? The magi, the wise men. Now, we talked briefly about this last week. And I just want to make a couple of more comments to help you understand the significance of what this Jewish writer Matthew had to say about these guys when he says, it was during the time of King Herod, and I processed that last week, the magi came from the east. Now, there is significance to what we're talking about today regarding the magi. In short, here's kind of a good way to think of it. If you are a student of Scripture, you will know there are 12 tribes of Israel. If you're not a student of Scripture, it's okay. You've come to a safe place where we want you to grow and learn and know more about what Scripture teaches. What Scripture teaches is there were 12 tribes named after the 12 boys of Israel. One of those tribes is called the Levites. Now, some of you, as soon as I say it, you kind of know the significance of what the Levitical tribe or the Levite tribe is. That's the priestly tribe. So, for all of Israel, the priest would come out of the tribe of Levi. Does that make sense? Okay. If that can make sense and you can connect those dots, then this will help you to understand the Magi. Think of it this way. This is the priestly tribe, for the most part, of the Persians. Now, there's biblical credibility to this. This is the priestly tribe of the Persians who have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years prior to the birth of Christ. We know we saw Daniel last week. We talked about the influence Daniel had on them. But we know it's more than that. We, we know that there are, are multiple times in Scripture where they are referenced. Now, here's a little bit of background on, on uh, the Magi that, uh, that I'm hoping will help you to understand this particular part of the birth of Christ. No one could become a Persian king without first doing a couple of things. So when you look at the Hebrews, you look at the people of God, the, the, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, there would be a process that they would go through to become the king. And we know that God's original intent was not to have a king like all the other nations. The Persians aren't like that. They are the other nations. So they're perfectly comfortable with having a kingship. But what they did was they established some specific things that helped them to identify the best way to install a new king. For example, a new king in Persia would not be installed as a new king without first mastering the spiritual disciplines of the Magi. Now, <clears throat> to help you kind of get a feel for this... Uh, uh, Think of it this way. If a king is going to be installed as the new king, he's going to sit on his throne and they're going to put, let's say they put a crown on his head and he's the new king of Persia. What they would do is the magi, because they had these spiritual disciplines involved in their life, the king would have to master those, but also he never was placed in a position of kingship or on the throne without first the magi, the wise men, anointing him. Well, part of the anointing process, they used a fragrant oil called frankincense. Now, <clears throat> it's really interesting because when you read through the Old Testament, and I know a lot of you have read through the Old Testament, some of you are still trying to figure out if you want to read the Old Testament to get a full understanding of it, I would encourage you, read it. It's, it's fascinating, incredible. It's the Word of God. It's life-changing. Eleven times in Scripture, you are going to see references to the Magi. Matter of fact, there is a famous Old Testament phrase. I'm going to say it, and now you're going to go, oh, that's what that is? There's an Old Testament phrase that goes like this. The laws of the Medes and Persians, or the law of the Medes and Persians. Read the book of Esther. There was the law of the Medes and Persians. Read the book of Daniel. There was the law of the Medes and Persians. What is that? These are laws that were established by the king, not Israel. A Persian king and his consultation, his wise men, were the magi. 
Now, does that make sense? Okay. Not, not that today is about a history lesson. It's about helping you to understand the details of this incredible writer named Matthew who said, you need to know who brought these gifts. It was these wise men who had influenced for centuries the pagan world. Well, why do these pagan men then show up to give these gifts? We talked about it last week. You remember why? Because they had been influenced by Daniel. When, Daniel, when, when King Nebuchadnezzar said, somebody needs to come and interpret the dreams because my magi can't do it, my wise men can't do it, somebody, and they went, hey, we know this guy, his name is Daniel, he could interpret your dream. And when King Nebuchadnezzar's dream is interpreted, he's so impressed, he puts Daniel, a God-fearing man who understood the scriptures over these wise pagan men. So Daniel was able to influence them. How cool is that? And then hundreds of years later, when Jesus is birthed and born into this world, you see these guys show up. Why? Because they understood the messianic prophecy that one day a Messiah would come, the King of the Jews, to take away the sins of the world. I mean, it's really, when you start to understand Matthew chapter 2, it just captures our hearts. It's so impressive. But he said in here that Magi came to Jerusalem and, and, and they said, where's the king of the Jews? And we saw a star in the east. We don't even have any specifics on the star. And I thought about talking about the star, but for sake of time, I'm not going to. But there was a star. There were Magi. These are some of the details of the birth of Christ. Now, Listen to verse number 11 and read the rest of chapter 2 on your own. Coming down to verse number 11. On coming to the house, so when the magi show up at the house, these wise men, when they show up at the home, they saw the child with his mother, child. It's a literal reference to probably a toddler. They bowed down and worshipped. That's the first key indicator. It was about the condition of their heart first, not their offering. I'm going to say that one again. It's one thing to give an offering, but if the condition of the heart is not pure, then the offering is not acceptable to God. That's a big deal. <clears throat> they bowed down and worshipped Him. They opened their treasures, and they presented Him with gifts of gold and of frankincense and myrrh. See, the wise men understood he is the king of the Jews, and every king, anytime you come into the presence of a king, you give a gift of gold. So they brought gold. We talked about that last week. But frankincense? Why? Why? And, and I've got a couple of ways we could illustrate that up here, and I'm just going to set them out here as a visual for you to understand. My guess would be, and, and I think this would, uh, this would be a good way for you to think about it, it could have been an oil substance, which may very well have been the case, or it could, it's not, it was probably not a stick. I'm just using this to illustrate it. My guess would be it was probably a powdery substance, and, and, we, and I'll kind of help you to see that. So what is the meaning of this gift? What is, what is the translation of frankincense? How does that, how does that, connect with us and resonate with us because it's this highly prized, expensive scent. Well, to help you understand it, I'm going to give you a, a visual here. This is a, um, this is a Boswellia therifera tree. Now, aren't you glad you came to church to learn that? <laughs> That's what that tree is right there. And in the, in the wintertime, in the Sinai Peninsula, what they would do is this tree, they could cut a slit in the base of the trunk of the tree and out would come this ambery, yellow, gummy resin. If you've ever seen maple trees give off maple syrup, think of it that way. And it would give off this, this yellowy and reddish a uh, gummy substance out of the tree, this resin that would come out of the tree, and we call that in the English language frankincense out of this tree. And they would capture that, 
And they could do a number of things with it, but most of the time in first century what they would do is they would, they would take that gummy substance and they would spread it out and let the heat and the, sun and, the, and the air dry it out and then they could smash it up into more of a powder feel to it. And then they could do a number of things. They could transport it a little bit easier and they could, and well, what would happen in Israel, in Jerusalem is you could get this expensive powder form in Jerusalem at a high cost. Not everybody carried this stuff, but it could be imported into Jerusalem and then sold in the marketplace and they would use it for a number of things. And, and scripture tells us a number of times that, it, that it's actually used. And after it's harvested, this is important to you and I because as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, you're going to see that this, there is a reference, I said earlier 11 times, it's actually 17 times, 17 times there's a reference to this in the scriptures about the importance of frankincense and what it represents. Now, here's kind of the short, the skinny of this. It was mostly and almost every time in scriptures when frankincense is mentioned, it is in connection with the priesthood of Israel. Now, this is important to you and I. Because the priesthood of Israel, the Levi tribe, which we talked about just a moment ago, what they would do is they would ordain one of the new priests by taking a mixture of frankincense with some oils and they would anoint the new priest over Israel. Another form of the way they used frankincense would have probably been in more of a powdery substance where they would put it in a basin, could light a fire under it, just as you saw me light a fire to it, and it puts out an aroma. And many of you in this room smelled that aroma. And they would offer this. A good example, Leviticus chapter 2. Leviticus chapter 2 gives a time where the priest would offer up a sweet, you ever heard this phrase, a sweet smelling savor or a sweet smell to God. So when they brought their offerings, when the priest brought their offerings, you remember what the offerings were? It was the slaughter of an animal. Now, if you've ever been around the slaughter of an animal, it may not smell real good after some time. So one of the things the priest would do was offer up the scent of incense and frankincense would have been one of the things the, the, the priest would have used to offer up. It, it, kind of think of it like this. When the priest would offer up at the meal of offering, one of the celebrations that the Israelite people did, at the meal of offering, one of the things that they would, get, that they would do is burn frankincense so that, and I'm going to use modern day language, this isn't exactly how God would say it, but I, I, I hope with integrity this will make sense. Wow, that smells good, is what God would say. As, he, as he's in heaven, he would be able to say, Hmm, that smells good. Now, it's not just the scent. It's about the condition of the heart. It's the offering of his people. But for us, man, we think linear. We're going to offer up a scent. Many times in Scripture it says that this would be offered up well-pleasing to the nostrils of God. So what we know about frankincense is that this is part of the gift of offering that is given to a priest. So are you starting to connect the dots with why would the Magi give frankincense? <clears throat> We're in the middle of the 90-day giving challenge. And uh, just trying to celebrate God's grace in our lives and distribute that to as many people as we can. can uh, let me just say again, I want to put a plug in. Next Sunday is going to be a remarkable day. Do you remember what time you're coming next Sunday? Yes. 10 o'clock. Is this our 10 o'clock service? Yes. Have I already done the early service? Yeah, okay, I did. I'm just kidding. I'm just trying to get you to think with me. So I already told the 830 people, they are welcome to come at 830, sit. We'll turn the lights on for them. But they're going to join us. It's going to be a, a pretty good full room. Don't let that hold you back. If you've got family, friends coming into town, bring them. It's going to be a remarkable day, and we're, we're going to have a cool celebration. Here's why it's going to be important that you, you come and you're in your place. We have invited a lot of unchurched people to come on that day. Because if they're getting gifts because they don't have a parent here, we're asking a grandma, an uncle, an aunt, a sibling to come with them to receive these gifts. Don't, don't just not show up. They need to see a demonstration of God's grace through you. It's going to be a really great day, and we'll have four of our missionary, our kingdom come partners with us. 
and, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, some of the things that they do. It's not going to be a super long service. Uh, we're going to keep the same similar time frame, but what we want to do is just how God has blessed us. Let's in return bless others. Now, here's one of the things we want to do. Not everybody in our church maybe could contribute a gift to a child or maybe a, a monetary gift to help one of the missionary families, but you could give the gift of words of affirmation. If you've ever read the five love languages, you'll know why that term is such a critical term. Because words of affirmation mean something to everybody. <clears throat> For example, I may say, surely the scarf you're wearing today is beautiful. Where'd you get it? I'm trying not to look at Shirley because I already spotted the scarf. <laughs> but I didn't want to bring all that attention to her. Miss Shirley, thank you for wearing the scarf. <laughs> Did you have it made? Did you buy it somewhere? Somebody gave it to you as a gift? Okay. Beautiful scarf. Steve, I love the red jacket with a black tie. Those colors, they're awesome. I love red and black. And I just want to say thank you for wearing red and black on this Sunday for me. <laughs> now, do you see how words of affirmation, I know Steve, he likes to wear different colors. It's an unmentionable word in this place, but he likes wearing the color orange and blue. But today for me and for my illustration purposes and because of his love for his pastor, he wore black and red. And I noticed that his wife, Alain, wore black and red as well. Now, do you see how words of affirmation can really encourage somebody? So here's what I want to do. I'm going to press pause in the middle of my message. Because in this room, as we prayed earlier, there are people with lots of heartache. Mr. Roberta, I was praying this morning for your husband. See... <clears throat> There are people in this room, you're walking a journey that there's some challenges. But nothing should hinder us from just speaking some words of encouragement in somebody's life. So here's what we're going to do. If you're on the end of this aisle, man, you came to the right seat today. Would you reach under that seat and grab those cards that are under your seat? If you're on the end of that aisle, would you grab those cards under your seat? If you're on this end, would you grab the cards under your seat? Just grab a card and then pass one down. I'm going to tell you what I want you to do with this card. So... <clears throat> I'm coming up here. There should be a, a pack of cards like this. So, everybody grab one of these cards. And here's what I want to do. I'm going to put the names of four families that I'd like for you to write a note of encouragement. Just select one. And let me tell you who they are. Here's their names. What we're going to do is just write a note to just words of affirmation. Encourage them. And here's how we're going to, when we collect these, we're going to put them in a box. Nobody's reading them other than we just need to know. So make sure you put a name on there. We're going to put them in a box. So four gifts next week. Will, one will be for Andy and Nancy Anderson from Word of Life. Now, let me tell you, these are brand new missionaries to us. They don't draw a salary from anybody. They, they don't have an hourly wage or an income. They rely by faith on churches to supply and pay their mortgage. They're one of our partners. They minister to our high school and our middle school kids. It's part of what we do here. It's a curriculum thing, and we've done mission trips. So Andy and Nancy Anderson are the missionaries. Greg and Debbie Kappas. De Greg has actually preached here. They're part of the Timothy Initiative. And uh, just an amazing couple. Uh, you're going to see them next week. Love them. Their daughter is in seminary at Dallas, theological, and then they have a high school daughter. All four will be with us next week. Basically, Greg is... He's, he's a guy that helps churches think about how do you reproduce and multiply. How do you become a mom church to baby churches? How do we get more gospel expressions out there? And Greg just does a remarkable job. John and Heather Langford are a young couple with four babies, four small children. Uh, the oldest is maybe nine, I think. They have twins that are about nine and then some younger ones. John came down as a church planter from Atlanta. He was a part of a church in Atlanta, Georgia. Came here as a church planter. And uh, he wanted to plant a church in the Disney area, and, uh, and, and things didn't go real well to begin with. And, um, and, and there were some real challenges, because he was a part of an organization 
that uh, once Disney and this organization didn't see eye to eye on some issues, and so they asked John not to participate because of the organization he was connected to. John was devastated. So John kind of retooled, that's where we came into the mix, and us and some other like-minded churches kind of came alongside and said, hey, we believe in what you're doing. Now it's cranking, he's getting traction, and he's got ministry to all Disney employees. That's his church. He's, he's not trying to reach anybody outside of Disney, just employees. 65, 66,000 employees employed by Disney. And that's his ministry to try to reach them. A lot of people that are internationals. And he and his family moved here to start a church, and we've been a part of them. So that's John and Heather. Terry and Erlene Williams are part of the Florida Baptist Convention, which we are a part of the Florida Baptist Convention. If you've kind of watched, we restructured recently in the last... Uh, 45 days, the Southern, uh, Florida Baptist Convention is restructured. And a lot of men and women that were uh, employed through the Florida Baptist Convention um, either lost a job or their job shifted dramatically. Terry is one of those. And uh, Terry's, uh, Terry has led worship here from our platform. He's really highly connected to our worship pastor, Tim Foose, um, because he leads a ministry called the Florida Worship Choir, which goes around to the churches around the state of Florida and does a number of things. So there's the four couples and families that will be with us. Would you just ask God, I'm going to pray in just a moment, ask God, which one should you write a note of affirmation and just say something to them like, hey, we love you, we believe in you, um, praying for you, well, whatever you want to say. Would you affirm them? And then we're going to put them in a box and then we're going to send them home with them to open and read cards from you. Make sense? Father, in these next few moments, would you bless as we just write a quick note to one family. May you use our words to affirm them, to keep going, to keep serving, keep living for you. In Jesus' name, amen. As the music plays, take a minute, write a note real quick. Anybody need a little more time? Any unused cards, you're welcome. If you want to write more than one, you're welcome to. I'd encourage you maybe not during the rest of the sermon to write it unless you're just compelled to do so. Uh, but maybe even after the service, you're welcome to write a few more cards. Now, we need to collect these real quick. So um, could I get some really fast runners to just collect these? If you're on the end of an aisle, just pass everything to your left. Everything to the left, and uh, Tom, can you grab them over on that, going up that aisle for me, just down that left side? John, you got this left side. Hunter, can you just kind of go up this left side and grab these for me? And uh, then somebody in the back will grab those cards, so just pass them down. And we're going we're gonna to put those cards in their box and just say thank you. We appreciate you. If you need more time, hang on to your card, and we'll, uh, you can finish it and just drop it off at the back. Uh, after the service is over. So these will be great, great uh, cards for us to just show uh, some generosity through words of affirmation next week. So back to this gift. The one who got the gift, Jesus, again, it's an interesting gift given to a toddler, but it is a prophetic gift. That's important for you and I to recognize. And the prophecy is that Jesus would become a priest. Now, not in the sense that you and I understand it, but he would become what's called the high priest. Now, let me, let me explain a little bit. 
When I say it's a messianic prophecy, what that simply means is it's something that happened before Jesus was born, knowing that the Messiah would come. That's the easiest way to explain this to you. For example, the psalmist David said, he gave a messianic prophecy. In Psalm 110, David said these words. I think we're going to actually put that up on the screen for you. Do we have Psalm 110? Psalm 110, verse number four. There it is. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Quote, here's what the Lord swore and he's not going to change his mind on. You are a priest forever. Now, this is a messianic prophecy. This is, it's obvious that you've got to understand, and maybe it's not obvious to everybody, but you've got to understand this is not written about David. This is written about the coming Messiah. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, anybody in here, your first name is Melchizedek? <laughs> Melk literally means king. You can pronounce it Skedek or Chedek. Don't you like that one? Chedek means righteousness. So king of righteousness, Melchizedek, king of righteousness. Now, the significance of Melchizedek from the Old Testament was this, and this is kind of simple and brief for us. He was the one who united the office of priest and king. So he takes, because remember, again, Israel has established a kingship. They already had a priestly tribe, the Levites. Melchizedek is the one who brings together and unifies king and priest together. Example, King David was not a priest, but he was a king. But his royal son, Jesus, would become a priest. So God swears an oath in Psalm 110. Now, this is not an oath with the Aaronic covenant of what he made the covenant with Aaron. But it is that the Messiah would live forever. I hope you catch this. After the order of Melchizedek. Think of it this way. David died. Jesus lives forever. Now this is, this is a big deal. Because the book of Hebrews calls Jesus our great high priest. Matter of fact, Hebrews uses it 11 times, speaking of Jesus. In the Old Testament, you remember what the priest, one of the functions of the priest? One of the functions of the priest was to be the go-between between between God in heaven and the people. So rather than have direct access to God, you went through a priest. Make sense? Now... If Jesus is our great high priest, then the way we have access to the Father is through our priest. Make sense? Now some, even in the 21st century, believe that our access to the Father is still through an earthly, a man priest. I would disagree fundamentally on Scripture with that. Our access has been granted through what Christ has done through the cross, burial, resurrection. There is not a man out there that can serve as the go-between for you to the Father. The only one is Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4. Listen to what chapter 4 of Hebrews says. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, speaking of Jesus, who has gone through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Verse 15. For we do not have a great high, or we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one, speaking of Jesus, who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Chapter 10 of Hebrews says this. Verse 12. But when this high priest, or when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, what was that? The cross. Jesus, the high priest, went to the cross. He offered sacrifice once for sins. Then what did he do? He sat down 
Where? At the right hand of the Father. Now, why is this important? Now, think of it this way. In the temple, in, in the first century temple, even prior to first century, out of all of the... Uh, out of all the different articles of furnishings, and the temple was elaborate, it was beautiful. Out of all the articles in, of furnishing in the temple, there was one thing not in the temple. A seat, a chair. Why? Because the work of the priest, it was, it was symbolic that the work of the priest never ends. He's always doing work. He's always offering sacrifice. He's always offering for the people. Now, I get pretty excited. I actually have chill bumps right now in my arms. Because when I process and think about the significance of Jesus and what he has done, he leaves heaven. He could have come in with pomp and circumstance, and he didn't. He came in the form of a baby. Think about it. I mean, he could have come in with an entourage. He could have come in with both guns smoking. He didn't. He came in humility. In the form of a baby. Jesus lives a sinless life. Hebrews 4 says, tempted just like you and I, but did not know sin. None of us in this room can say that. Every one of us have given into a temptation to sin. Yet he knew no sin and what does he do? He goes to the cross as our substitute. What you and I could not do to pay the price, what you and I could not do to earn the favor of God, what you and I could not do to earn the righteousness of God had to be done through sinless, perfect blood sacrifice. And there was only one that could do that, and it was Jesus. And it was his sacrifice on the cross, our substitution, who took sin on Jesus dies on that cross. Three days later, we know the story. He rises again. He rose from the dead. And you know, you remember, he appeared to a number of people. He spends the next 40 days preparing them, igniting them for the movement we now call the church. The grace era had begun. No longer is there a need for the priest because the great high priest has handled it all. The great high priest Jesus has paid once and for all for sin. And what does he do? He goes back to heaven after that 40 days. He ascends back to heaven. And what does he do? He sits down at the right hand of the Father. And that, what this identified is, it's done. The mission is done. Hey, Father, let me know when it's time to go back and get him. And I'll, I'll, what I'll do meanwhile is I'll become your intercessor. This is beautiful, guys. Why is this important? Because Scripture teaches that the enemy is constantly bombarding God against you. Did you know that? Did you know that the enemy is constantly planting seeds of discord and disunity between you and the Father constantly? Yeah, you, you said that scarf's really nice. That scarf's not nice. Red and black. The enemy wants to distort truth. And he'll do anything he can to distort it, including your relationship with the Father. So who is at the right hand of the Father? Oh, man, is this not good. He is at the right hand of the Father saying, I didn't need a chair back in on the earthly planet. I didn't need a chair in the temple as all the other priests may have wanted one to sit down because they got tired. But they didn't have a chair in the temple because they couldn't complete the mission. There was no reason to sit down. I've completed the mission. It's done. I have won. And it's over. Father, they're yours. And when God the Father looks down at you and I, those of us that have given our lives in faith to Him in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, how does He see you? He sees you as righteous. Oh, that's good news for me. He sees me through the blood of Jesus who is at the right hand of the Father. This is such a good piece of the Christmas story. That sometimes we can just read and go, well, yeah, Jesus came and he put on some flesh and then it was over. Man, 
The Magi identified through the wisdom that Daniel poured into them that one day one would come who is greater than all and he would go to the cross. He would finish and accomplish the task that no other man could do. And one day he will ascend back to heaven and then he will sit down because he has completed it all. Jesus, you reign. Yeah, that is good. Hebrews chapter 7, here's how we'll wrap up. Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews identifying, talking multiple times about the great high priest. Listen to what chapter 7 says. If you've never read this, you need to just highlight this verse, put it on the refrigerator, you've got to know this passage. Hebrews chapter 7. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in their office. There's been a whole lot of priests, is what Hebrews writer said. But they've all died. They couldn't continue in office because of this capturing thing called death. Oh, but verse 24. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for us. Hebrews 7, 23 through 25. Church, you need to know that you have a friend in Jesus. If you do not know him, I hope you hear the incredible story of Christmas this year. And I pray you would accept the greatest gift ever offered to you and I. And it was the gift of salvation through Jesus. There's going to be a lot of gift exchanging over the next few weeks. There will be no gift greater than the gift of eternal life. If you do not know Jesus, please, would you give your life and faith to him? The wise men, the magi, they brought the gift that was used to say, he is a king. Here's some gold to identify it. But they also brought a gift that said, we know he's a priest. And he is the priest who will live forever, making intercession for you and I. No longer is there a need for an earthly priest to offer sacrifice for you and I. No longer is there a need for someone to go between you and I. I am not your go-between to the Father. Jesus sits on the throne. He has completed everything. And He desires to be in relationship with you. May you have an incredible Christmas knowing that the King of Kings is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you.